Hey guys, so in today's video, let's talk about the periodic table of elements. So here, I've drawn the periodic table, and let's take a, a quick look at it before we move on. Okay, so now that we've seen the entire periodic table, let's look at what the numbers on the periodic table mean. I haven't drawn them here because they'd be too tight then, but if you look online, you'll find periodic tables that there are numbers in each box. Now, all periodic tables are different, but in general, they put three major things. The atomic number of the element, which is the amount of protons the element has, or in other words, the identity of the element. The symbol, which derives from the Greek, Latin, or English name, and it's what symbolizes the element. And lastly, the atomic mass. This is just how many grams a mole of the element will have. Or, in other words, how many atomic mass units an atom of the element will weigh. So let's look a little more. The atomic number is, like I said, what makes the element, well, the element. If two atoms have different numbers of, of protons, i.e. different atomic numbers, then it won't be the same element. The symbol derives usually from the English name, because if you look at the periodic table and the names of the elements, you'll find that most of them will have the same letters in their English name. However, a few of them make an exception and there are a total of 11. Some, such as, let's see, sodium, potassium, silver, and gold break this rule because their symbols derive from their Latin name not their English name. Lastly, their atomic mass is basically the average of all the masses of the isotopes of the elements. We'll talk more about that later. Now the symbol is also very important when you're writing chemical formulas. When you're writing a chemical formula, this is the basic structure. You first have the symbol of the element, and you always put the number of atoms there are. And if necessary, you put the charge as the superscript. And here you put the mass, which is usually unnecessary, and the atomic number, which is, again, somewhat unnecessary. This is be Let's look at an example. So here is a chemical formula, propane. You probably heard of propane because it's one of the fuels used to cook food. So the symbol here has C and H, and if we look back at our periodic table, we'll see that there's a carbon and a hydrogen. The subscript right next to here means how many atoms of the symbol that's right before it. Because 3 is right after C, aka carbon, there will be 3 atoms of carbon and propane. Similarly, there will be 8 atoms of hydrogen and propane. So now let's move on and see how many subatomic particles each element has. So the amount of protons an element has is, again, the atomic number of the element. The electrons, however, gets a little more complicated because it's the atomic number minus its charge. <coughs> For instance, for the case of fluoride, fluorine's atomic number is 9, and because the charge is negative 1, 9 minus negative 1 is 9 plus 1, which is therefore 10. Lastly, the neutrons are probably the most complex because you need to know the atomic mass of the element before you know the amount of neutrons. So, because there are many isotopes of elements, you need to know the specific isotope you're talking about before you say, oh, this isotope has, say, 44 neutrons, or 46, or 49. So, you may wonder what an isotope is, and it's basically just the same element, except with different mass. For instance, a good example is bromine. Bromine has two major isotopes, bromine 79 and 81. Because both of their atomic numbers is 35, right? Because they're both bromine, but because their atomic mass is different, 
we can say that they are isotopes of bromine. And because the mass is different, but because the atomic number is the same, the amount of neutrons is the one that will differ. For the 79 isotope, we'll have 44. But for the 81 isotope, we'll have 46 neutrons. Another thing you should know is radioactivity. You see, some isotopes are stable, like say hydrogen and deuterium, but some other isotopes, like say tritium, aka hydrogen 3, is unstable. So they will want to go from an unstable state to a more stable state, as everything in the universe does. As they decay, they emit one of the following particles. The neutron, you probably know this guy. Proton, again, you should probably know. And then there's the alpha particle. The alpha particle is basically just a helium atom, but without its two electrons. The beta particle is not too different from an electron, except instead of orbiting an atom, it got ejected by a radioactive decay. And lastly, the positron. The positron is kind of like the antimatter version of the electron, and it has the same properties, except a positive charge instead. Now, sometimes radioactive elements can either spontaneously decay, in other words, just split into two random atoms, or emit energy as x-rays or gamma rays. For those, you can never say what comes out because x-rays and gamma rays don't have a specific mass or charge. Another thing about radioactive stuff is that they're either natural, like say uranium or thorium, and others like americium or californium are, are synthetic. In other words, they're made in particle accelerators and they never exist in nature. Okay, now let's see what a mass spectrometer is. A mass spectrometer is basically something that takes out the abundance of elements in the sample, more like abundance of an isotopes of an element. What it does is that it vaporizes the sample, shoots a beam of electrons, and of course, we will have ions. We then separate the ions and then find the charge to mass ratio. Usually though, in the graph of the the mass spectrometer, we can just say that the charge to mass ratio is just a mass. So here I have two examples, magnesium and bromine. I know bromine comes out of on this video. And you'll see just a sec. So these y coordinates mean the relative abundance of the, the isotope. In other words, how abundant the isotope is on planet Earth. And these are the masses of the isotope. For the case of magnesium, we have the most abundant isotope is 24, and 25 and 26 are the less abundant ones. If you look at the periodic table, magnesium will have a mass of 24.3, and that's because we're not, there's no isotope called that, but we're just summing up the average of these isotopes and then putting it as the atomic mass. For the case of bromine, it's actually extremely interesting for the case because unlike most elements that have only one prominent in isotope, bromine has two most abundant isotopes, the 79 and 81. If you look at the periodic table, they will say that bromine has a mass of 80 or more precisely 79.9. The reason why it's called 79.9, but there's no such isotope called bromine 80, is because the abundance of the 79 isotope is 50%, while the 81 isotope only occurs 49% of the time. So if you look at the average, the 79 is a little more abundant, making it closer to 79.9. Now that we know a little more about the isotope, let's go ahead and look at some trends on the periodic table. You see on the periodic table, well, a bunch of the elements tend to have very similar properties. And I've listed some groups where the elements actually do have similar properties. Every single whole group of them have similar properties because of the electron configuration. For a case of an alkaline metal, for instance, 
they only have one S electron to give away to go to a stable noble gas configuration. So because of this, they are very active and want to give away their electrons as fast as they can. The halogens behave similarly, except they just need one more P electron to go to a noble gas configuration. And therefore, they want to take electrons from the other atoms to get to that noble gas configuration. Let's look at some physical trends on the periodic table as well. You see, physical properties are basically things like, you know, density, solid, the phase, and other stuff. There are only a couple gases on the periodic table. The noble gases, obviously, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. We also have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, hydrogen, and chlorine. These are the only gases on the periodic table, and we only have 11 of them. There, it's extremely rare to encounter a liquid element, and because there's only two of them, mercury and bromine. All the other elements are solid, mainly because, well, they're metals. Some others are unknown because they decay so quickly, there's really no way we can actually see them. Also, another reason why we don't notice the matter of the elements is because as we only created so little that there's no way of seeing if it's solid, liquid, or gas. There are three major types of elements in the periodic table. There are, there are subcategories of these, but in general we have three. The first one is the metal. Of course, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with what a metal looks like, right? Shiny, hard, that kind of stuff. But the chemistry definition is that it's also malleable, conductive, and forms positive ions. Also, most metals, like I, most elements, like I said, are actually metals. The opposite is the non-metals. The non-metals those are more of a brittle, dull, and in appearance, and aren't great heat and electrical conductors. Of course, there are a few exceptions like graphite, but in general, they're really bad conductors. Also, because they're closer to a noble gas and when they're gaining electrons, they want to be form negative ions. What's cool though is that there is a borderline between metals and non-metals, so-called metalloids. Their properties are somewhere in between metals and non-metals. For instance, they're semiconductive, and they also are shiny, but sometimes other allotropes can form dull forms. If we look all the way back in our periodic table from the start of our video, you will see that our metalloids actually form a borderline between the metals and non-metals. See that? So all the other metals here, except for hydrogen of course, are metals and all the guys over here are non-metals. Let's go back. Now we also, I mentioned the word allotrope. And an allotrope is basically just the same element, except in a different form. Mainly because their atoms are arranged differently, or they have different structures. Carbon is a very prominent example of having tons of allotropes. Graphite, obviously you're very familiar with it, right? You use it to write with pencils. It is also diamond, because diamond tends to form these carbon carbon bonds in a network. And of course, if you have a lot of people bind together in a network, it's much stronger than just binding people to two or some group. Because the carbon atom can form four bonds, car diamond can have a very tough structure. <coughs> Graphite, on the other hand, will only use three of its valence electrons. The last fourth p electron the last p-electron is used to bind the two layers together. So if you rub graphite on, say, a piece of paper, there are the lower layers and the upper layer, there's p-bonds would break, 
and they would adhere to the paper. Other times though, instead of giving a special name for an allotrope, we can also sometimes call an allotrope by its color. For example, phosphorus, we have white phosphorus, red phosphorus, purple phosphorus, and black phosphorus, and a bunch of others. Some allotropes, like the white form and red form, are somewhat stable, while others, like black and purple, aren't exactly that stable under normal conditions. Now, let's also look at more physical trends. This one is about the melting and boiling points of the elements. So I've written two examples. One's the alkali metals and the others are the halogens. As you can see, the upper number is the melting point and the lower number is the boiling point. If you look at this graph here, you can see that the melting and boiling points tend to decrease as you go down the group. However, the opposite becomes true for nonmetals, as the boiling and melting points increase as you go down the group. This is because London dispersion forces occur between the nonmetal atoms, and I'll explain that for another video. For now, we can just see that there is a big trend between elements on the periodic table. Now you may wonder, what makes an element active or inert? or at least more active than this groups on this metals on the same group. Well, that's the topic of atomic radius. As you go down a group, the atom's radius will tend to increase because if you look here, there are more shells than the previous this row. So the atom will tend to increase in size despite being more nuclear or charged toward the electrons. Similarly, as you go further to the left of the periodic table, the radius will increase as well. The main reason is because although you have the same number of electron shells, you actually have less electrons. You see here for lithium, we only have three protons in the nucleus, right, because the atomic number is three. But for beryllium, they have four protons pulling on the electrons. So they'd be more attracted to the nucleus. Ultimately, when you get to fluorine and neon, they'd be extremely tiny because there's tons of protons pulling on the same amount of electron shells. Ionic radar is also affected in by electrons. You see, the valence electrons are obviously what the furthest electrons are. But if the valence electrons go away, the, the atom would get much smaller, right? All cations, or at least most cations, are much smaller than the original atom, about half the size. Mainly because most cations will have lost their entire shell while becoming a cation. For anions, though, the size would increase as you gain the electrons. Now, the reason isn't exactly proven about this drastic increase in size. However, scientists have found that one of the reasons could be because this extra electron added here could contribute to extra electron-electron repulsion forces and therefore pushing away the, the boundaries. Bigger atoms also mean that the valence electrons are easier to knock off. And we'll see that right now. You see, for the case of sodium, let's say, the valence electron requires 496 kilojoules for every mole of sodium we have. So if we want to convert a mole of sodium into one mole of sodium 1 plus ions, we need 496 kilojoules. However, just to get rid of a second electron, we mean we need a ton of more force. 4.563 megajoules a mole. So if we want to convert to sodium 2 plus now, we're going to need, well, this much energy. This is quite a lot. And to get rid of the third electron, we need even more at 6.913 megajoules a mole. So if you, as you remove more and more electrons, you're more likely to need to consume more energy 
and taking them away. However, the ionization energy will decrease as you go to a larger atom. Here I have an atom of potassium drawn, and as you can see, only need 419 kilojoules per every mole to convert a mole of potassium metal into a mole of potassium ions. To get rid of the second electron, you only need 3.051 megajoules, which is much less than sodium's 4.563. And to get rid of potassium's third electron, you only need 4.411 megajoules. Surprisingly, it's even less energy than sodium's second electron. So as you can see, this is why metals tend to get more reactive as you go down the group. The electrons are much easier to knock off. And therefore, we need someone to catch it. This now is photoelectron spectroscopy. It's basically just applying light to an electron so that it can knock it off the orbitals. The binding energy is the amount of energy the light needs in order to knock the electron off. Now, most of the time, the actual data you get is extremely complex. So as usual, we developed an idealized model, which is something like this. The y coordinates is the intensity, which is in other words, the number of electrons the shell has. And this x coordinate is the binding energy in terms of megajoules. Let's look at an example. Here's the one for nitrogen. As you can see, the 1s orbital, which is which has the least energy, it has more binding energy. In other words, it binds more tightly to the atom, and therefore you need more energy to tear it apart. These peaks also show how many electrons are in the shell. For the 1s, we have 2, same for 2s, and for 2p orbital nitrogen, we have 3. So that's how you read and interpret a, a photoelectron spectroscopy graph. Let's, to end the video, let's also talk about electron affinity and electronegativity trends. Electron affinity is basically just how much in, how happy an element would be if it grabbed an extra electron. If the, the more negative a number gets, the happier the element is, and the more positive it gets, it isn't exactly too happy about it. In fact, some elements have positive electron affinities and therefore, we usually just put it as zero electron affinity because you need to add energy to force the electron into the atom. So, for a case of chlorine or some other very electronegative atom, it would be very happy if it gained an electron and give energy and therefore ending up with chloride. However, some other elements, like say beryllium here, would need energy to shove that electron into the beryllium atom. And that's because beryllium has a complete 1s and 2s orbital. So the next orbital you put it would be the 2p orbital, but the 2p orbital is pretty high in energy so you're going to need a lot of energy to shove that electron in. And lastly, based on electron affinity and a bunch of other factors, the great chemist Linus Pauling came up with this, electronegativity. Now electronegativity of the, all the elements would just be crazy, so I just wrote a few here. Electronegativity is just how much an atom would want to keep an electron for itself. The more electronegative things get, the more likely it is to hog electrons towards itself from other less electronegative elements. There's also a trend even here. I know there's a lot of trends on the periodic table. Anyway, as you go up the periodic table, you can see that the electronegativity tends to increase because the electrons that come in will, have, will experience greater nuclear charge because they're closer to the nucleus. As you go to the right, electronegativity will also increase because now you have more protons in the center that will want to grab electrons. So, 
That was our lesson about the periodic table and a bunch of trends on there. Thanks for watching and see you in our next AP Chemistry lesson. Bye!